it's about 3.30. I've got um, 10, 11 students in the room, Michael. And I think the view that you have of the room, you can see some of them. Uh, but, but what you see is kind of the center um, view of the room. It's a, a really wide room with some great technology that, um, yep, there I am. Uh, and um, it's got great technology, but as I said, you know, most of us kind of look at this room and have no idea how to operate anything. It's smarter than all of us. Um, this is the last class for the effective search techniques. And um, I thought it was fitting for, to have you in this class. I'd hoped to have you the first class, but glad that you were able to come for the last class. And, and I'll leave it to you to introduce yourself, because I would probably botch it, uh, except to say that I've known you for a long time. You are a wonderful presenter, a good friend, a, a good photographer. And um, you are a good photographer. You really are. Uh, you're obsessed with photography. Uh, and um, and evidently don't have enough time on your hands because now you've written like twelve books. Well, ten. And that, uh, so you know, hey. All right. Um, <laughs> thanks, Jill. Um, uh, in, in my defense of the photography, I just take lots of photos, and some of them turn out good. So, anyways, that, that's that's my spiel there. Um, I'm Michael Sowers. I am the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, Technology Innovation Librarian is one of those titles that basically means go figure out what's coming, and figure out how it's going to apply to libraries, and then teach it to other people. So I work on a lot of projects. I do presentations. I'm doing a class on e-books and e-readers here at the Commission tomorrow. Um, I'm uh, doing... Uh, WordPress-based installations for public library websites, a statewide project we're doing here. So kind of what I do is really, really varied. Uh, yeah, I've written a couple of books. So I've got a couple more coming out. Um, and Jill asked me to kind of talk about searching in general and what um, I, I, I'm stumbling a little bit because I had a little trouble trying to decide what I wanted to talk about in this. Um, but it kind of started to come together about a week or so ago when somebody specifically asked me um, in, an, in an online interview I was doing, what specifically do you see coming down the pike future trends in searching? And I kind of gave them three answers. I've kind of got four and a half answers for you guys, thinking that would kind of fit into a last class. So some of this you may have already talked about in class. Um, some may, you may have dealt with specifically. Uh, one or two of these ideas I've got, I've just started thinking about literally in the last couple of weeks. So maybe if we've got some time for some Q&A at the end of our half hour, we can uh, I can maybe get your opinion on some of those things. So um, I do have over to this direction. Uh, I'm sharing a screen here. I've just got my web browser up and a couple of bookmarks that I'll be pulling up. But um, I mentioned I kind of have, I think I said four and a half, actually five and a half different things that I want to kind of briefly talk about for just a couple of minutes each as how I see search going, search um, things we need to start keeping in mind. I hate to make predictions. I really do because generally I'm either really bad at it or just, you know, ask somebody 10 years ago if we would have had the iPad. Uh, when I started playing around with internet and searching. I graduated from University of Albany's uh, MLS program back in 95. Uh, the internet, the web was about a year old. The uh, most popular search engine and the best one out there was Alta Vista. So I don't know if any of you even remember Alta Vista. Google hadn't even happened yet. And now I pretty much live in the Google environment myself. So the very first thing, kind of the, the half point I want to prelude all this with uh, that I see happening with searching is, uh, the way I like to phrase it is, is kind of advanced searching is coming out from behind the curtain. Uh, and there goes my phone. I'm sorry if you, if you heard that. Turn the sound off. Um, let me just show you an example here. I've done a kind of a quick Google search. This was the, the loose connection to carousels that I was mentioning before we got started. Um, and where I, I mean by advanced search coming out from behind the scenes is this area down here on the left. So I just want to do like one or two real quick searches to show you what I mean. 
Uh, Google has been going through some redesigns lately, especially with the recent Google Plus. Some of you may or may not have seen the new Google Toolbar across the top of the Google properties. They're rolling that out literally this week. Um, but this gray area across the top is what they call the Google Toolbar. What they call down the left, and I didn't know this until uh, an interview with a, a Google employee I was watching on Monday, they call this area down the left here the Google Tool Belt. And the scenario I like to use just to kind of show these advanced features coming out front instead of having to specifically go into advanced search is the stuff that they put into, into the tool belt. And I can spend hours just on the options here. Let me give you just one scenario. Um, I worked before I get into libraries in uh, bookstores. Uh, my wife is currently at the uh, Lincoln Public Libraries here, the city library, working reference. And in bookstores and, and in public library reference, you always get that question. I'm looking for this book on a particular topic, and it's blue. Okay. Um, I wish Google existed back in the, the mid-90s and early 90s when I was working in bookstores, because people always came in looking for that blue book on a particular topic. So just to set up my scenario here, a uh, patron comes in. I'm looking for a kid's book. It's about bar carousel horses, and I know it's blue. So I've done my quick Google search for, for Carousel Horse book. And just real quick, I'm going to switch over to images here. And you'll see I get a lot of additional options down the left by subject. I can limit by sizes. I can limit by type. I can uh, limit by time. But this one I always love to show here is this any color, full color, black and white. Or, well, they said it was blue, so let's look for books uh, that are mainly blue. And as you can see here, we've got several choices to pick from and narrow it down. <laughs> I remember the days of having to build a search. Even with Google um, over the last couple of years, to get to these sort of options, you had to go to the advanced search. You had to build it. You had to know exactly what, the, what the, um, you were looking for uh, and know what the options were. And I think the more and more of these search engines are starting to pull those advanced features out, pull them out from behind the curtain, put them along either you know one side or the other, and allow people to have quick and easy access to these features that I think many searchers over the years have not been taking advantage of. So that's kind of my little quick little half point. Um, the, now the first big area that you, I'm, I'm assuming you, you probably talked about in class at some point is the idea of the social web integrating with its search, with search, social search. And just another quick example here, I, I did another uh, search on augmented reality here. And you can see we have kind of the typical list of Google results. We have our, our tool belt down the left-hand side. But I am logged into my Google account. And this, this, this is going to be important in a few minutes with one of my other points. But as I scroll down here, because of that, as you'll see here, um, people that I am following on other social services, such as Heidi with FriendFeed, this is telling me that not only is this a relevant result to my search, but someone I know on a social network shared this on that particular network back in February. As I scroll down a little further here, here's another one where Aaron shared this uh, and Lauren shared this. In this case, the sharing, I believe, was through Google Reader and through that share feature. So Google is pulling in social data to search results. So one of the things you start to think about, the impact here, is who are your friends or your, your acquaintances on social networks? How much do you trust them? And how important is the fact that they have shared this or recommended this or done something else on a social network into your uh, results for what you're looking for? Now, if you're looking for a straight-based factual answer, sort of a ready reference question, maybe this isn't as important. If you're looking for a recommendation on something, if you're looking for kind of um, what do people think about a particular topic, then I would say this could be a very important thing to start considering uh, pulling in the uh, connections you have in your social networks. So this could be one of those things where if you're one of those folks, I don't know if any of you are, who are like, eh, I don't really do the whole social networking thing. Well, this might be a reason to start because making those connections even if you don't necessarily know those people, if you can start making those connections with experts on particular topics that you're interested in, that may find you better results in the long run for the types of searches that you're going to be doing. The next area I, I've been thinking about a lot that um, is starting to affect search a whole bunch is a combination of sort of mobile and local searching. 
Um, I've got here a, a, a Google phone. This is my Android phone. It's a Droid Bionic. And I practically live my life off of this thing now. And it knows where I am. Now, some people, that really kind of starts to freak them out a bit. Um, as Jill can probably tell you, I, I live most of my life pretty darn publicly between blogging and social networking and checking into places on Foursquare and, you know, my parents never ask me where I am anymore even though they're back in Rochester because they can just go online and pretty much find out where I am. But because it knows where I am, it can localize the search results for what I'm looking for. So if I pull up Google on my phone and I type in pizza, by default, it's generally going to assume that I'm looking for pizza here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Or if I'm at a conference in D.C., um, down to the point where it will you know, give me that map and show me exactly where it is. And I was just playing with the, the new version of the Google mobile search on my phone. And it, it did something that, that I found distracting at first, but when it gives me a map at the top of the screen with results down below, and as you used to scroll up the screen, the map used to go off the top. Well, they've updated now, so when, when you start to scroll, the map stays at the top, and the listing that you're currently seeing, listing A, listing B, listing C, that part scrolls, and the map at the top of the screen shows you just the pinpoint for the item that you're currently on in your scrolling. So I can literally figure out what's closest to me, get directions from there, go into Google Maps, it's this kind of hyper-localized search, which can happen on the desktop. Um, if I go back up here, back to um, augmented reality, this probably is not the best search, but I can go to places. Um, there is a way I can pull up. Yeah, this is not really a great search, but there is a way I can say, you know, figure out the results based on where I am. Pizza probably would have been a better search. So that hyper-local is very good on the mobile platform, but just the mobile searching itself. Um, programs like Google Goggles, um, Amazon Price Check, Layer, which is an augmented reality uh, program. These, these apps on these mobile platforms allow me to do searching in ways that just a couple of years ago I couldn't have dreamed of. Okay? With programs like Google Goggles, um, I can just hold up the camera on my phone to something, it figures out what that something is, it does a Google search on it. Um, with Amazon Price Check, the, it says you can scan it, say it, or pick, pick it, like picture it, photo it. And the idea is there I can scan a barcode, I can talk into the microphone, or I can take a picture of an item, and it's going to go out and not only tell me how much it is on Amazon, but find other stores online, and in some cases even stores local to me, bringing it back to that local search, and tell me how much it is at those locations. And I can either buy it online or I can go to that store down the street. Okay. Layer is an augmented reality program. And I don't know if you've discussed these, but this is the sort of thing that starts to kind of freak me out from a technology standpoint. The idea is that I can hold up my phone to, say, a landmark. And this software will not only recognize the landmark, recognize combination between the, the look of the item and where I am via GPS, and then overlay what I'm looking at on that screen with information about that thing that I'm looking at on the screen. Um, there's a commercial for some phone company somewhere. I'm not, I'm not sure which one it is, but the, the man and the woman are standing in the street corner trying to pick a restaurant, so they hold their phone up. And they, they, they start looking at the screen, and it, you know, a friend says, yummy noodles, go eat here. That's augmented reality, and that's search. That's pulling online data and overlaying it in a layer on top of actual reality and pulling that information together. So in, in a case like that, you don't even necessarily have to think of it as search. You're just saying, hey, what's that? And that data gets pulled into you, in for you and presented to you. Unfortunately, Stuff like that doesn't work really well in Lincoln, Nebraska. I don't know if any of you have tried it in Syracuse, but you know, try like in LA, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, that sort of thing. There's lots of data, and, and it gets kind of interesting. And I've also heard of a couple of libraries starting to play around with sort of aug augmented reality platforms. The third major topic I wanted to mention is, is search result customization. 
And depending on your point of view, this is kind of um, a really great thing to some people and a not so great thing to some other folks. Um, I mentioned in these Google searches that I'm doing here that I'm signed in. If you see my, you know, my name is right up here, my, my, um, my avatar is up here in the upper right. And the idea is that I'm signed into my Google account at this point. Um, what is important here is that, and I'll just continue to use Google as an example, but Google's not the only search engine doing this. It's tracking what I click on. It's tracking what I search. It's tracking um, potentially how long I've spent on certain sites. It's tracking what I've shared. It's tracking potentially what I've bookmarked if I'm using Google's bookmarking service. And the idea is that all of that stuff that I do, it remembers and influences future results. Now, from my point of view in general, this is not a bad thing. I want it to remember the types of things that I'm generally looking for and present to me back in the future the same sorts of types of things. Um, where this maybe isn't necessarily such a good idea, and I'll, I'll, I'll hold up a book title here, because uh, The Filter Bubble by Eli Pariser, um, this is a book that is actually actively criticizing this sort of thing. The subtitle is What the Internet is Hiding from You. And, I wouldn't say it's the internet that's hiding it from you, it's maybe the search engines that are hiding it from you. But the idea that you can so hyper-focus your search results that you don't get things out of what you normally look for. You might not get alternate points of view as a search result. You might not get that serendipity or those unexpected results because your results are being customized for you on a constant basis. Um, I don't necessarily feel like I've run into that as a particular problem, but I think it is a legitimate issue that we need to start considering. What's really fun, and, and I don't know, Jill, how, how you've been doing things, but I remember teaching a, the, the searching class, uh, even back in library school, back in 94 and 95, and it was kind of wonderful because you could say, okay, everybody go to this search engine, type in these terms, and we're all going to get the exact same results. Now with all these customizations and these localizations and all these issues I've been talking about, I can have a room full of people type in the exact same search results, and especially if they're logged into their accounts, they get significantly different results. So from a teaching perspective, that's a little annoying. And then from a larger perspective of relevancy ranking and kind of these traditional things that we consider when putting together a list of search results, we start pulling in these newer things, and maybe we're not necessarily getting exactly what we're looking for. Um, usually I recommend in a reference situation, don't log into accounts. Stay logged out, don't let it track that stuff, um, and then you're probably going to get more of kind of a, a generalized set of results than something that's a little more focused to a particular user. Oh, um, let me tell you that in, in a different class, I had a student working on reference questions here in the United States, except she's from Scotland, and she was signed into her account which thought she was in Scotland, and it altered her results. And she had to consciously think, oh, wait, I don't want the results for this question in Scotland. I want the results for this question in the United States. Yeah, that's, that's, that's almost a, and, and she would have lost points if she had put down her original answer. Yeah, that's definitely going to be an issue. So um, that, that's kind of a, 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 a combination of the customization and the localization um, even though you're not physically there because your account was registered there, it thinks you're there. So, yeah, that, that's definitely an issue. Um, the next larger one, uh, now we're getting in kind of um, larger issues. I kind of tried to put these I issues in order of kind of small, medium to large here. And this next one is the idea of the semantic web. Now, I don't know how much you, you may have talked about this as it applies to search, but right now as we look at most content on the Internet, it is text, it is static content, it is, it, is, it is becoming more social, but in most cases the internet is still pretty dumb. It, you're, you're still relying on basic keyword matching, you're still relying on um, you type in this word and you know this word is in this document, but the search engine or whatever software is processing that content doesn't understand the content. It doesn't have a context. It's just raw data. Well, you start the, the idea behind the semantic web, and I, I just finished co-writing a book on this, and I still have trouble explaining it, um, is the idea of giving 
that content a context so that when you search for something, a piece of data, the search engine, the software that is indexing and processing that data actually can understand what that data means and then apply that to your search results. And so the, the one real kind of best example I can give you, and I, I don't know if you guys played with this, but it is Wolfram Alpha, which is, they describe it as a computational knowledge engine. They don't actually call it a search engine per se, although you can kind of generalize it to a search engine. And I, I, I almost wish I had more need for using Wolfram Alpha. I, I find it very fascinating. But, for example, I can just say something like population of New York and pull that up. And if, think of, you know, if you did a Google or a Bing search on this, you're going to get, you know, you'll probably get an answer up at the top, which is really good. And then you'll get a whole bunch of documents or web pages that talk about the population of New York. Well, in this case, it actually did pull up New York City for me in this case. It kind of assumed, so I might want to actually change that. Well, I'm going to leave it at New York City, even though I meant the state. Okay? It's telling me this is what I thought you meant. Here is the result. Here is now a population history, urban area population, metro population, nearby cities. It, it understood what I was looking for and is able to pull in data and then analyze and process that data because it, it has that context, it has that understanding. Where it gets really interesting, and, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying the things you can do with Wolfram Alpha here, but I'm going to change this to New York City just to specify, um, and Lincoln, Nebraska, and change that search a little bit. And now what it's going to do is it's going to take that data and it's going to compare them between, and you know obviously we have very different uh, populations between New York City. And you can start to actually have this process that data because of the concepts of the semantic web in that context. And I, I, like I said, I find this so intriguing of the idea that instead of just raw data matching and spitting me back something that may or may not have the answer, this is not only giving me the answer, but also processing the data around that answer and giving me possibly even more information than I asked for, but information that is relevant to the question that I asked. <clears throat> the last topic is the one I have been thinking about for all of about a week and a half, and I'm still not sure where my brain is going with it. Maybe we can, we can start a little conversation with this, but it's this idea of Reintermediation of search. Um, going backing up just a little bit, we used to have search in the early days of the internet, or actually, let's let's go pre-internet. Search was very intermediated. Um, databases, yes, we had some patron access, but you really had to be that expert. So you talk to a librarian. The librarian did the searches mainly because searching was expensive in some cases, and then provided the results back to the user. So you had somebody in the middle of that process. As search has proceeded with the internet and you know, AltaVista and, and Lycos, boy, where did I pull that one out? Um, and you know, Google and Bing and, and search engines like today, it's very disintermediated. In other words, it's direct the uh, patron is just going in and doing the search. And this is what a lot of people have said over the years, you know, why do we need librarians? We have Google. Okay? We can just you know, do the searching ourselves. Well, there's this sort of re-intermediation going on when it comes to things like Siri. Now, I don't have an iPhone. I'm an Android user. Um, I have not played with Siri. I don't know if anybody in the room has, has a current iPhone and, and, and has played with Siri, but the idea is that you now kind of have a program, a piece of software providing the service sitting in between you and the search engine itself. So in this case now you, instead of going straight to Google, you ask a piece of software your question, where's the local pizza place, it does the search, brings you back what it thinks is the best result or results for you. 
I'm not sure where this is going. I've, I've read very mixed reviews about um, services like Siri. Um, there's kind of an equivalent service or two available on the Android platform. It's kind of all ties back to that mobile sort of thing I was talking about earlier. But the idea of adding that extra layer of interpretation back into the process of search that isn't directly the user going directly to that search engine and then processing the, the results for themselves, but having something in the middle, in this case now software, processing those results on behalf of the user. So, to uh, just quickly go, go back over what I talked about here, kind of the uh, half idea at the beginning of bringing that advanced search back kind of from behind the curtain. Social search, mobile and local search, customization, semantic web, pulling it out there, and this concept of possible re-intermediation of search, I think are all things that, that I'm looking at, I'm starting to deal with. Um, some of these have come into um, mainstream a little more than others as we're coming through, but I think these are the things looking forward that we need to be dealing with. And well, I'm, I am intrigued by re-intermediation which which I typed into Twitter and was able to spell correctly. Um, <laughs> so I so I wonder I'm I'm kind of mystified because I kind of think of it as being a bad thing, but um, but I don't know. And so I'm going to walk back through the room. I don't know if anybody here has a. Oops, sorry. So about anything that Michael's talked about, but especially about re-intermediation. I, I, I will also admit I, I kind of got that idea from uh, Leo Laporte, who does the, the, the Twit podcast. He's the one who kind of brought that idea up in, in some show I was watching. I, I, I don't know. I have an opinion if it's good or bad. I think a lot of it's going to be dependent upon how good or bad the software that's doing the job is. And Siri is kind of a first-generation product. So even if it's bad now, that doesn't mean it won't become better in the future. Everybody in the room has an iPhone, iPhone 4. Um, I will by the end of the month, so I'll let you know how it goes. But um, so anybody have comments, questions? Jen, you look in inquisitive. Yeah. Um, I'll also I throw out a couple of bookmarks I have here real quick. Uh, this is a feature that was added to Google, I think, yesterday. Um, but Google is now also a graphing calculator. Oh, it did, hold on. Um, I, I don't do math, so I, I thought I had kind of pre-saved this search. Um, but if you type in, now I can't even copy. Jesus Christ. Let's try this real quick. I thought I had this planned out well. There we go. Uh, yeah, so, you know, for, if there's anybody who actually understands math in the room, uh, Google now actually does uh, graphing calculations. So I'll just throw that out there. found an article uh, about it. I'm not sure where. where? Oh, uh, CNET has an article about um, Google becoming a, a calculator. Graphical calculator. Okay, so um, this class is unusually quiet. It's the last week of the semester, too, so everyone's brain cells are just kind of fried. So um, I'll turn around to the person who always has a question. <laughs> I guess he doesn't either. <laughs> In what ways do you think reintermediation will change the way librarians can keep doing their searches? If we do get added back into the supply, sort of, then how do we make sure that we're important and used? Oh, wow. Um, well, here's the thing. I'm not necessarily, at least, at least as I thought of it so far and as I'm describing it so far, I'm not necessarily sure that we're the ones who are being integrated back in because it's, it's kind of software doing our job um, so I'm, I'm 
maybe at a certain level, librarians need to be involved in the creation of that sort of software. Now, maybe this will go nowhere. I, yeah, I really don't know. Siri is, is what, a month old, I think? Uh, and I've literally been thinking about this for about two weeks. Um, more and more, though, I think we, we, we always have been the intermediary, and it's just a question of letting people know, oh, this is that question I always can't have a good answer to. <laughs> um, Jill, help me out here. <laughs> it reminds me of being um, Data on Star Trek, where Data was a computer kind of connected to the knowledge of the universe. And they would ask Data questions, and then Data would kind of crunch through everything and deliver an answer. So in the best possible wor world. Um, and I, I saw on TV this weekend these emotion robots, or robots that can tell jokes. They're like these little interactive kind of cute thingies. Um, and so maybe there's, maybe this isn't just answers. Maybe it's um, a smart little tool that you can have conversations with and occasionally will give you answers. Like, you know, my favorite one at 8 o'clock in the morning would be, what's the weather? Well, maybe, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a, a story I just heard recently from uh, Jamie LaRue, who's the director of the Douglas County Libraries, I think I got that right, in, in Colorado. And it's kind of to answer the question in a very long roundabout sort of way, but I'll, I'll keep it as short as possible. What he ended up doing was he had one of his librarians literally going out into the world, leaving the building, and showing up at public meetings of business leaders and city councils and, and uh, other groups and listening to what they were talking about and then ultimately saying, hey, you're trying to figure out X, Y, and Z. I can help you do that. Um, so instead of having or expecting people to come to us and knowing that we're better than that piece of software. Now, this isn't the sort of situation where you're talking about what's the weather or, or this, this graphing of, of, of a calculation here. But I, I think the situation was something like they were trying to decide when they redevelop Main Street in town, is parallel parking or angled parking better? Well, you don't type that into Google and, and find an answer. And so this librarian from, from Douglas County kind of integrated themselves into that process. And then when she was all done, I, the, the, the business community was like, can we keep her? <laughs> um, and she went back to the library. So I think... Part of the trying to overcome the, the perception of we're replaceable by Google, we're replaceable by a search engine, is to go out and actively prove that we're not instead of expecting everybody to come to us, which is what we've always done. Does that maybe provide a better big picture answer to the question? Big picture answer. And by the way, someone said that they've heard that if you ask Siri about Google, that Siri has smart ass answers. <laughs> um, there, there was also, I mean, there, there's also been some uh, kind of um, pseudo political com, uh, controversy over Siri lately about what you can and can't find if you ask it certain things. And people claiming that it was, uh, you know, Apple decided that it wouldn't search for that versus it was a programming error. Um, I, I don't want to go into what the actual topic was. Um, so, to to which I would just stress that yes, it. Something like that is a first-generation technology. This is the first real try at this. Um, I mean, I can talk into my phone and get Google results, but that's not necessarily the same as a piece of software saying, here's what I think you meant, and here's what I think your answer is. That, that is, a, is, is a slightly different scenario. Are there, I look around the room. Are there other questions? By the way, this is a. Uh, everyone has a laptop in this class, so I've seen some active tweeting. I've seen some searching on things that you've been talking about, um, and pulling up. And, and for a while, they were like doing the same results you were doing. So it was actually pretty cool to watch. Um, any questions? I look around. Oh, Allie. 
Hi. Um, what do you see as some of the technologies that librarians should be looking out for in the next year or so? Um, e-readers. <laughs> I, I hate to almost fall back on that, but I, I've been teaching a series of workshops on this in, in, over the last couple of months. And, and I got to tell you, with, with things like the Kindle Fire, the new Sony Reader Wi-Fi, with, with the um, uh, OverDrive integration, uh, and, and, you know, make me clarify any of this if, if, if you're not familiar with some of it. Um, just because Christmas is coming and it was bad enough last January for public libraries when everybody got their new devices, I think when devices are now 79 80 bucks, um, I think this next year is going to be – the year of the e-reader for uh, libraries. I mean, that, that's, I think, the single overriding technology that's going to happen, whether it be in a tablet, tablet platform or e-reader directly. Um, that's the one big thing I think that um, we're all going to be dealing with this year. Good answer, too. Anything else? Michael, I owe you. I will. I will see you in. Uh, I think about four months. I have every intention of being at computers and libraries. Yes. So back on your end of the country. I'm gonna uh, end the recording. I did record this, and um, and let you sign off if you like. Thanks, everybody. And, um, yeah, Jill has my email and address and everything. So you know, feel free to drop me a line if you got any other questions. I'm I'm here to help. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>